This is the Doctor Who Alhambra podcast, episode number 95. We have five more to go till we get to 100. Celebrating the five more till we get to 100, on the other side of the pond, we have... Hello, I'm Humphrey. Hello, I'm Liam. Well, and this podcast is, at least for me, has been something... Uh, a long time coming, personally. I've been uh, eagerly anticipating. We've had two months worth of Big Finish releases, as well as the New Year's special. It's actually... Do you know what? Saying, getting me to say the New Year's special is was the hardest thing ever. Because <laughs> I'm so used to saying Christmas special. But with that in mind, just before we begin, um, the the New Year's special special is the only new series Doctor Who TV show that will be aired in all of 2019. Yep. Which makes it both the best Doctor Who show to air in 2019 and the worst one to be shown in 2019. So, <laughs> there you have it. Yep. You did? Uh, um, before we get to the big finish releases and some other talk, uh, one thing that I'd like to get you guys' thoughts on is mm. I personally think that Big Finish needs to take this whole year, this whole 2019, and basically over publicize and basically put on sale all of their cl- their new series stuff. I mean, like, ads galore in Doctor Who Monthly, and then just basically discount all of, like, you know, classic Doctor's new monsters, the 10th Doctor with Rose and Donna, the uh, 11th Doctor uh, Chronicles, the 10th Doctor Chronicles, because I think this is Big Finish's big opportunity to really pull in more fans of Doctor Who. What are your thoughts? I suppose it could well be, because um, the fact that we're having a, a dry year, so to speak. Well, a dry year for, for TV, at least, not a dry year for Big Finish, because, I mean, well, Christ, not. it's... it's, it's... 20 years of Doctor Who's this year. Um, yeah. So I foresee the bank balance going, no! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think they've done a pretty good job, to be honest. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, the fact that they're getting, you know, various actors back and, and, and or, you know, introduced into sort of big finish and things, I think is... is you know, it is pretty good, uh, anyhow. So, I don't well, think really, uh, and especially considering they still keep winning awards at the you know audio drama thing. And I mean, the fact that they were showing the prisoner on Radio Four recently, you know. Mm. So I don't think, uh, even if they're not doing and promoting Doctor Who, that people will come to look at Doctor Who because of the other ranges that they've put out. So, I wouldn't have said that they're doing too badly. And if you think about it, a lot of the ranges that people, or that they are airing on for extra, people are fans of Doctor Who anyway. Like The Prisoner, and, you know, and again, I, th- I think, is it Attergirl? As well as the yeah. Gods of Frost is up for, um, up for an award. Um, well, not only that, but uh, a couple, like, most every single one from the uh, Doctor Who, or not Doctor Who, Big Finish Originals seems to be up for at least one award. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know how the hell to this day, though, how Gods of Frost managed to get an award because oh. that was Four just... episodes in. I, ca- I can't do the two last ones. I cannot. Oh. I was lost after episode two. I was like, what is this meant to be? I mean, granted, uh, it, it, the, the cliffhanger that I've been left on is waking up dead inside a snowman. And mm-hmm. you know what? I don't care Ooh, if I ever find key. out. <laughs> yes. Um, but At A Girl, I think, deserves definitely a second series and an award because that was just fantastic. Mm. Uh, 
So well, I, I, I think did, they're, did, know, uh, they're doing Je- fairly well. Jeremiah Born in Time, is that up for an award No, no, unfortunately oh, not. That's a shame. I know, it was a brilliant series. Well, it is a brilliant series. And I mean, again, yeah. I, that, that deserves a second series. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, no, totally agree. And so does Shilling and Sixpence, I must admit. that Yes. That needs a second series. It was only Gods of Frost and Girl, I think, that got um, an award. And I think Cicero, the pilot, was up for yeah. original audio drama. But that was before it got commissioned into a full series. Mm. I think, anyway. I could be wrong. So, you know, I think they're doing pretty a pretty good job mm. in, in that sense. Oh, yeah. But I, I, I'm, and so with this, with all, all those things being awarded or being nominated for awards, then you have the whole year of Doctor Who off of the television. Hmm. And then I, I just went over every single new series connection release so far re, um, that has been acknowledged through the Big Finish site and hmm. or the um, Vortex. You have... January of 2019, you have the Diary of River Song box set five mm-hmm. with Derek Jacoby, the War Master, Michelle Gomez reprising her role as Missy, and then you have Eric Roberts, the Master from the uh, TV movie, back. <clears throat> yep. February brings a Twelfth Doctor uh, short trip story. Yep. You have also in February Missy series one. March is the 8th of March, March with yep. that fe- features River Song, Madame Vastra, Osgood, Kate Stewart, all that fun stuff. You have the Time War also in March. In April, you have <laughs> units, the, the new series Unit. Mm-hmm. In May, you have the 10th Doctor Adventures, Volume 1, with Donna and Wilf. Volume in June, three, you it? have... Three? What was that? Volume 3, is it? Three, four? Yeah, volume yeah, 3. Volume three. Hmm. And then you have... Um, at least in May, you have Torchwood the, uh, with the mm. s- featuring the Slovene, which could bring in some new Who fans. Oh, don't forget the past... God, God, God Among Us as well in in, uh, in, in February well, for this month. Yeah, but I, I, I'm sitting there looking at the from the perspective of what could possibly bring uh, in oh, new fans, right? Yeah, new point. Who fans. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And so in June, you have the Pastinus Gang. In July, you have the War Master, Rage Against the Time. Also, you have the Legacy of Time, feature, which is a whole Doctor Who special release. In August, you have the, the Diary of River Song, Series 6. You have the Eighth Doctor, uh, Time War, Series 3. In September, you have Rose Tyler, everybody's favorite, the Dimension Cannon. <laughs> uh, o- October, you have the Pastinus Gang, S2. Then you have the Eighth Doctor, Ravenous, Series 4. There's nothing released so far in November. And then December ends the War Master uh, final Range. fourth box set. Yeah. So, mm. I mean, at least New Who-wise, characters that people would be familiar with New Who. I, to me, personally, this is where Big Finish really needs to just take the leap and make the most of this hiatus. Yeah. Mm. But then, uh, like I said to you before, don't forget, it's 20 years of Doctor Who. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating a massive month you know massive year of releases oh yeah mm. i mean uh, uh, the, the, all that stuff is is stuff 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 i typed in early january and mm. i can only imagine like you said your 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 uh, bank statement will probably take a massive hit eventually <laughs> because there'll just be even more stuff to be coming out it's with like, oh no stop it but it will <laughs> Yeah, um, you, you, so, you'll, you'll just see a tweet from me going, Brett, I'm homeless. <laughs> but at least I have that uh, big <laughs> finish. <laughs> <laughs> at least I have big finish. <laughs> uh, Rose the Dimension Cannon will keep me warm. Uh, why? Why? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, um, no, I think actually this year, uh, uh, as you say, I think New Who's been quite well represented, actually. Mm. I'm quite looking forward to it. Speaking of new who being re- represented, what let let's take a step back. The whole of series eleven is done. Jodie Whittaker's first season as a Doctor is complete. We've had ten episodes plus the uh, not Christmas special, the New, new Year's Year special. special. What are our? I'd like to get your th- raw thoughts on series eleven so far. 
Well, for me, personally, I really enjoyed it. You know, it had it, some stories perhaps weren't as good as others, but what I liked was the fact that, unlike Stephen Moffat, the series, you know, was, you know, more straightforward. There wasn't all this silly, overcomplicated nonsense that he would write in for no apparent reason. You know, the stories, to me, were just more, well, proper Doctor Who. They, they In a way, they were very reminiscent for me of the 60s who, um, you know, the William Hartnell era, you know, Three Companions being the obvious one, but also the fact that historicals, and it was very much, you know, exploring, whereas with sort of Moffat's era, it was very much just, you really didn't know where you were with half of the stories, I found, whereas the stories here were much more straightforward, and I found, for me personally anyway, just a lot more enjoyable. I thought Jodie Whittaker was a fantastic doctor. I like her companions. Granted, I think Ryan is the weakest of the three, but still, you know. So me, I, I think it's pretty good, personally. For me, mm, mm, meh. I like Jodie Whittaker in the role. I don't feel at this point in time the writers have a handle on her actual doctor though she's a bit kind of all over the place with her moral compass she wasn't really given a massive moral dilemma which i think she should have been given you know if you consider like tom baker and genesis for example i feel the writing was kind of average yeah there were some standout episodes the doctor for my liking didn't get enough storyline or screen time it was still kind of about the companions rather than her. I don't think she was, you know, as a new incarnation was ex was explored enough. Uh, I like the fact, you know, that, that, that there was three companions. You know, it was a nice harken back to, you know, Ian, Susan and Barbara. Again, I agree with Humphrey. Ryan definitely is the weakest and he needs to go. <laughs> like <laughs> last week, I find his acting very wooden he may look animated on the screen but he sounds like he's just reading off a bloody tax form yaz and graham i think have more of a rapport anyway graham was definitely the standout companion out of all three and is it me or has the time war just been forgotten well not only that but i mean what was it capaldi's doctor was trying to find gallifrey and then She's no mention whatsoever. And it just like... I mean, that was the, the you know, sole purpose when Matt Smith left was he finally found Gallifrey. Mm. The 12th Doctor was constantly trying to figure discover where it was. And then we just had 10 standalone stories. That may well change in the next series, though. And And here's my question to you, Brett. When... Did the Time War end? Did the Time War end in Day of the Doctor? Or did the Time War end in Hell Bent? I think the Time War ended in Day of the Doctor because it, the, again, Gallifrey was sucked into a pocket dimension. That pocket dimension, which essentially prevented it from total annihilation from the, the Daleks, it prevented it from. It you know it was just mm. moved essentially. So, but then, but then, really, the, the Daleks have won because the Daleks are back in the show. So, what what happens now? Well, the, the the hardest thing about the Daleks, though, and to think about this, and uh, I w would love to get your opinions regarding the Doctor Who resol uh, resolution because mm. I had massive complaints about that story. But regarding the Daleks, is there? It's they're literally all over the place. You ha when you think back to the new series, you know, supposedly there's a time, the Great Time War, where the Daleks and the the Time Lords were basically destroyed, ended up destroying themselves. Supposedly, mm -hmm. there's only one Dalek left. It, it, it's a really hard episode to figure out what it's called. You know, Dalek, and then you have that. Then you have the Emperor, you know, using what is it, satellite. Five, five yeah mm. and turning the contestants into daleks then you have the army of ghosts which 
had all those Daleks that were put in that in the void, mm. which were actual proper Daleks. Daleks. You have uh, the uh, the what is it the the Davros in uh, the last one who basically Danny you know, yeah he showed off like his like destroyed body that he basically used his genes to recreate the Daleks and then you have the uh, the ones with the, the Skittles Daleks with when Stephen Moffat took over where uh, the the Skittles Daleks destroyed all the other Daleks because they were not pure. And then so, they got wiped out of history because, well... The and then they bang, got wiped out of history with... And, yeah, and everything the, got reset. Exactly. And so then... Mm. We're, so all these Daleks that exist, are they... Again, you, you have to often wonder, are they proper Dalek, Daleks? Where, where did some of these things come from? And it's uh, the the whole Dalek l- timeline is enough to make you go insane nearly because mm. it is mm. all over the place, which is one reason why I do struggle with the resolution is how does this Dalek know the doctor? Well, well, that's... the Dalek knows the doctor because all Daleks know the doctor because they get imprinted. Yeah. With, you know, uh, with, with I suppose, the Doctor's bioprint data, don't forget. And even though, even though the Doctor regenerates, you know, the Daleks still recognize him slash her. So, mm. because the bioprint, because, okay, oh. because, okay, the Doctor may have changed, but overall, it's like our DNA, the bioprint data is still the same. But remember what uh, Clara did. Uh, she wiped the the knowledge of the doctor out of all the Daleks. To be fair, though, that Dalek that is in <clears throat> resolution w- had been on Earth since the ninth century, so God knows exactly. how it got there. So it could have been before before Clara wiped it out. Yeah, exactly. And if it's been Bloody buried Clara. in the ground somewhere, it you know, mm. which it, which it had been. So exactly. So it probably escaped all of that. Mm. I mean, I don't know. I quite like the fact that it was a bit different, um, you know. And we saw, a, you know, and we finally saw a new Dalek because it's like, yeah, how many times are we going to get a Dalek episode and just see the usual configuration? You know, like I think, you know, they've got a good opportunity next season to bring back the special weapons Dalek, but make it center stage, not just oh, it's there in the background. Yeah, like now, come on, bring it to sun, you know, to front and center. Or make a it a like, threat. A bit like you know? Genocide Machine did. Mm, you know, make it actually a threat and make it like the standout threat of the of the episode. What did you think of the whole um, unit being kind of closed down pending investigation and people going, oh, that's a definite dig at Brexit? You know, I saw some people re- reaction to it. It's just like, oh, come on. You're, you're totally like, you know, throwing in modern politics, blah, 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 blah. And the way I saw it was the way that the old classic series would work canine. Because canine could basically, in some aspects, solve many problems. Mm. However, if you have canine being able to solve many problems, then these stories aren't interesting. If the doctor was able to call unit, Kate Stewart and the unit squad could basically solve this problem. I saw it not as a way of basically politicizing the uh, whole monotonous government situation, which, you know, governments basically do things that are just monotonous and Hmm. near pointless. But I found it as a way of, you know, the, the the sonic screwdriver couldn't solve the problem because the Do- the Dalek kind of prevented it from working after a while. Unit mm, couldn't come nice. in and solve the problem. It was the Doctor and his companions that were forced to solve the problem. That's yeah, how I yeah, saw yeah. Unit. Yeah, not that, I mean, and, and and also, I mean, you can see what the uh, big finish box is going to be. It's, it's going to be Unit shut down part two. Or the sack, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's going to be basically just all them talking about. Oh, by the way, we've been we've been uh, shut down pending investigation, and just like them bemoaning the fact that they've basically all been sacked. Unit the pink slip years. <laughs> Unit P forty five. 
<laughs> or is it P60? P45? Yeah, P45. <laughs> so, yeah, that's going to be quite a, quite, a, quite a funny thing from Big Finish, I think. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'll be quite uh, amusing. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't mind it. You know, I, again, like you, I, th- I thought it was quite interesting that, you know, that they, they, they went, oh, no, shit, we, we can't. Like, we're screwed. We're, you know, we're on our own. We have to do this ourselves. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't mind resolution. The only gripe I had with that episode was I feel Ryan's dad should have died at the end. Actually, no. So did I. I, actually, fact, I, I was actually, waiting actually, for no. both Ryan's dad. In fact, and somebody Ryan put this die. on Twitter. They said if RTD was uh, writing this, both Ryan and Ryan's dad would have been sucked out into that. And sun. that's what should have happened. <laughs> exactly. They should have had a, you know, a, a, a kind of final, you know, deep look into each other's eyes, holding hands as they got sucked into the sun. I thought that would have been fantastic. Mm-hmm. However, I will say, I don't know if you caught this, but mm-hmm. I caught this. Ryan essentially apologized to all of the fans in Doctor Who for being a lousy companion. Would really? you like to hear his apology to all the fans for being such a horrible companion? Uh, sure. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've messed up. <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm good enough. <laughs> I've let you down a lot. And I'm sorry. See? <laughs> <laughs> he apologized. Mm-hmm. You know what? Thank you. It, it takes a big man to apologize for things. <laughs> A lousy companion. And you know uh-huh. what? I appreciate that. Uh, it's still muffled all, uh, to all hell, though. Is it me, or, or does he like, not open his mouth in that entire scene? <laughs> what? Sorry, I didn't think quite, didn't quite catch that, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ye gods. Uh, so, just out of curiosity, so um, I I pulled this up because I sent this to you uh, over Christmas. This uh, one gentleman I really enjoy following on Twitter is uh, Doctor Who at Time Space. He's been posing lots of questions. In fact, Mm. he's irked a lot of people because he's posted stuff like, what is your least favorite episode or whatever? And people are just like, oh, I don't think that you should say least favorite because that basically means that the writing was was subpar and uh, the the people didn't do a good job. It's just, well, you know what? Sometimes people don't do a good job. Exactly. That's saying that the the costume design did it. There's 55, you know, there's 55 years worth of Doctor Who episodes, you know, there's going to be gold and there's going to be shit. Mm-hmm. So let's no, weed I out agree. the shit from the gold. Do you know what I mean? And at least to me, and I sent this to you, and I've been trying to find your response to this, but the, the question was raised is what New Who series, rank the New Who series from best to worst. And mine was, so going from best to worst, I went series four, one, five, ten, three, nine, eleven. And then underneath 11, I put the second season, six, seven, eight in that order. I did actually respond to that one. Yeah, I did. I'm, I've been trying to find your response to that one. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I, 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 to me personally, again, where I put series 11 is not the bottom of the barrel. However, many fans, when they replied to this, did put 11 at the bottom of the barrel. And I don't think that is fair at all. And I feel as though people are just jumping on the bandwagon of Jody Whitaker was well, I mean if you looked at Twitter, I mean I tweeted you like about the the recording of this podcast about uh, how neg- how further negative people have gotten since our podcast on fans toxicity uh-huh. and how people basically are saying it's not that Jody Whitaker is a bad actor, she was miscast. Which I don't How can agree you miscast? with. How can you miscast somebody? It's a bit... I don't know. I, I, I don't agree. Now, Ryan being a companion, that's a mistake, not a miscast. Or maybe the guy who played him. I, 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 that's the one I'm trying to figure out. Hmm. Is it the actor or is it the character? I'm, I'm... I'd, I'd say both, to be honest. Hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't like his character. I'm not overly fond of the actor. Um... And but that but that that's just my opinion. 
Uh, yeah. He he didn't enamor me in interviews. He didn't enamor me at that Comic Con panel. And yeah. I don't like his character. Okay, yeah, it was great that they that, that they had someone with a a disability. All right, okay, an invisible dis- disability, but still a disability to a point. Um, hats off to Chibnall for actually going out and finding a blind actress to play a blind character. Well, um, it's, it's funny because after our <laughs> discussion, one thing I did do during my Christmas break is uh, rewatched Battlefield, which I still mm. didn't enjoy. Oh, okay. And one of the... The, uh, the one of the opening scenes there is this blind lady who's sitting there reading bl- braille and i'm just like ooh they got a blind lady and then you know uh morgana comes over like touches her and and uh, she can see again i'm like oh so she's just a fake blind lady okay mm. yeah whereas uh, and, and, uh it, which goes to your point that you made about casting people with disabilities in roles that they a- of actual authentic disabilities. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Ellie Woolwalk actually is blind. Um yeah. I've not met her, but you know, we we you know, we've been to the college that she is at, at doing, you know, performing arts and, and and acting. So, you know, she is actually blind. Um yeah. which again, you know, it is a good thing, but again, it it, it it's it's not enough. You know, what needs to be done now is we need a, a blind person or a person with cerebral palsy or, or in a wheelchair in a main leading long running role, not just for one episode, a series. Well, there is one. Uh, at least there's a comedy in the United States called Speechless. Yes, which... I, I do know of it. I've been, meaning, been I've been meaning to watch it um, actually, but I mean, okay, yeah, that that that's one example. But I, mean, I don't think it's enough. I think there needs to be more mainstream, you know, more more stuff out there, more films, more more TV shows about disability but i mean this is this is the thing i think it's 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 striking that balance between yes giving them giving people with disabilities the main role versus normalizing it well and you brought up a really good point in your interview with uh david warner regarding (laughs) this whole thing if uh any of you did not listen to that podcast i believe it's podcast number 90 i think or I think it's either 90 or 89 that I posted that, Mm. but it's a really good podcast. Sadly, it was only a half hour, and then you had that horrible uh, truck that was backing up during Mm. part of it. Mm. Yeah, well, there's nothing we could do about that, though. Yeah, there's nothing. Well, you could have just walked out and just, like, you know, flattened its tires and be like, there, up yours. (laughs) Podcasting. (laughs) Uh. So, looking at Series 11... What do you think was any highlight episodes that really stuck out to you that you really enjoyed? I, I mean, because I was thinking about this before our podcast, and I was like, you know, I I found more of them enjoyable than many of Stephen Moffat's series five, six, and seven stories. I mean, mm. uh, the woman who fell to earth was great. Yeah. I enjoyed uh, Ghost Monument. Rosa again speaks for itself. Yeah, I mm. personally didn't mind arachnids in the UK. I didn't mind the it what is it? Ter, yeah. ter, ter, Tersunga conundrum that was meh, Awful. not good. Demons of Punjab was great. Having discussed it, it makes more sense uh, about the about you know about those things because I was on I I again and I think that was just not put across properly uh, or, or you know uh, uh, enough was that it, it wasn't stated very clearly but apparently the 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 assassins you know weren't always assassins they you know they took centuries to basically oh no become... I, I, I i felt as though that came across p- quite clearly i oh, just oh, did it? would have preferred oh, it being okay. uh, a more historical story and aspect personally mm. yeah yeah i mean i, I would have i mean it would have been Nice to kind of seen the after effects of the you know of like the riots and and all that in India and and what what really happened. Granted, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I think Rosa and Demons were probably the strongest stories out of the. Yeah, run. they were very good. See, I enjoy. I really enjoyed Kerblam. I I thought that was just just a fun. The only thing I didn't like was that stupid conveyor belt scene. 
Yeah. With the high five and, oh, God. Yeah, that was a bit silly, but the rest of it was good. Um, I have yet to watch Witchfinders just because I just saw so many bad comments that I just was like, it's eh. okay. It's, it's okay. I mean, it's not bad. And then yeah. I, I started watching the Battle of Rask or uh, whatever, and I just never spoke to me. I I just found the... myself tur- turning it off. Was that was that was that the last episode before Revolution? Yes. I must admit. I'm kind of in agreement with you. I kind of started watching it and stopped as well. But, I mean, personally, again, like I said, I would take Series 11 over 5, 6, and 7, which is sadly basically most all of Matt Smith's era. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, okay, there's a few standout episodes in Matt Smith's era, but there's not many. Oh, yeah. There are some very good episodes, but there's some sort of a rarity. Mm. So out of... 10 what would you rate series 11 as a whole encompassing the the new year special i would probably give it about a seven or eight i would think for me because i really Uh, did enjoy it i i'd say seven yeah i i would say seven with again and you you've said it all you you really brought up a good point (laughs) there's series five six and seven did have some really good episodes in it that are rewatchable. But for me, Series 11, and I would rate it as a 7, but I find if I were to be asked to rewatch a whole series from beginning to end, it would easily be 11 before the first three series of Matt Smith's era. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I really enjoyed Series 11, actually. There were, as I was say, one or two episodes that weren't the best, but that's the case with any season of Doctor exactly. Who. Exactly, and I mean, and that's, you know, and that's why we're going to do this Problems of Doctor Who podcast. Yeah. Well, I, I think if we, like, really look into it... Uh, oh, by the way, mm. so I was uh, on one of the Facebook fan pages that I'm on basically deals with all the missing stories. I have not seen it anywhere... But according to some of these people who are kind of in the inn on some of these missing stories, the next story, according to some of the people in this group, that is going to get an animation is Fury from the Deep. Mm-hmm. I was quite interested with that. And I, I've, I've searched nonstop on the internet for like the past two days trying to find out some reference to it. But these, uh, the, some of these people were the first ones to acknowledge that the Macro Terra was going to be yeah. uh, animated. So they're pretty... And that was before anything so they're was pretty... even whispered about so they're that. Pretty... Yeah, so, so they're pretty up there then in the known regards. Exactly. And it was funny because the, 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 the first thing that... The first comment besides, I like that story was, but why not evil? And I was like, yeah, you... you, you... Hmm. Exactly. Hmm. Hmm. So moving on from new series Doctor Who... To and I have purchased. It does it's not coming to me yet. I have put purchased the hardbound book of the Doctor Who and the Scratch Man. But you guys were, what was it? Who was saying that they've listened to it so far? I'm, I'm reading it. I'm about halfway through. How, what are your thoughts on that? It's a really good story, actually. I mean, it's it's written by Tom Baker, so it has you know some some lighter moments but mm-hmm. he's he, he really has sort of it's set out on a scottish island and there are some uh monster scarecrows and things which don't sound that scary but actually they are and the um there are some pretty scary concepts in it actually uh, as i say i've got halfway through now so it's really getting going um but it's it's a really interesting story. And what I like, because he's basically on trial with the Time Lords and he's telling the story, I like the fact that it's a story where essentially the Doctor tells the story. And it's just, it's an interesting uh, angle. I mean, in the in the early, early 90s, 93, uh, the BBC released... Uh, soundtrack cassettes of Power of the Daleks and Fury from the Deep. And the way they were presented was that Tom Baker told them as if he was, you know, telling a 
companion about his adventures. Um, mm-hmm. But and I quite liked uh, that format. I mean, in those instances, it didn't a hundred percent work because the editing wasn't as good as it would be now back then. But mm-hmm. you know, they they did work. You know, it wasn't bad. Um, you just could could tell that certain parts of the soundtrack had been kind of faded out to accommodate the narration. Um, but you know. F- for what they were, they were really, really good. Um, and, um, yeah, Scratchman, I, I like the fact you're sort of entering the Doctor's mind a little bit with it and um, sort of how he feels and thinks a bit. Um, it's No, I, I think it's a very interesting read, actually. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, s- speaking of books, just to transition... Did you guys hear that the final two stories mm-hmm. that have never been published in classic Doctor Who are going to be released in 2019? Mm. Yeah, Revelation and... Uh, Resurrection, Resurrection and Revelation. Ha- and they're coming out finally in be released. <laughs> yes. I don't know when they're going to do the audio book, but it says that the... The hardback is going to be coming out for both of these in 2019 with the paperbacks uh, getting their uh, target range, I think, cover in uh, 2020. I think the audios, I think Resurrection, the print edition is coming in July and I think the audio is coming in September or something. November. It's, It's slated as Resurrection is the 18th of July and revelation is the 14th of November. Yes. Oh, nice. okay. So I think, I think the audios are coming a month later. So oh, wow. I can mm. fly. That's, that, that's my birthday. Crazy. Oh, that's cool. All <laughs> right. Happy birthday, Liam. Yeah. Oh, a Dr. Who thing. Mm. <laughs> also, for those of you that uh, collect vinyl, the Daleks Master Plan is going to be yeah, released you know, in vinyl. I I was looking at that, and then I got the ma- you know, and then and then they were like, "Oh, we found a whole bunch of new tapes with clearer editing and 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 stuff, and episode inserts and all that." And I'm like, "Yeah, they're probably going to redo these on, on audio, so I don't really want to buy this now." Mm. I was tempted. Don't get me wrong. And I was like, hmm, 100 quid. Mm, no. So, yeah. yeah. With, with with that, all that new stuff that's being found uh, audio tape-wise, I totally agree with you with yeah. that. I think what they'll, they'll do some re-releases, you know, they'll keep the same narration and everything mm. that they've already done, yeah, but they will just alter the, the... They'll edit in better sound clips where... Either that, either that or they're going to animate it. Or both. I would love for them to animate that. In fact, I could see that happening first. I could see the animation uh, being released before. Oh, no, actually, I could see them redoing the whole vinyl thing, the sound, and then <laughs> then coming uh-huh. out with the animation to make people buy it twice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh well, of course they would. Mm. So those are just some of the new things that I've seen for Doctor Who. So let's go from new series Doctor Who and some of the news to November releases from Big Finish for two thousand. No, not November. December releases for December two thousand eighteen. We're gonna travel back in time just about well two months from the day of this recording. The first release is the main range 245 Muse of Fire, which features the Seventh Doctor, Ace, and Hex, which I was really gra- glad to get him back in this story. Also featuring Iris Wildtime and David Benson as as uh, Liam's favorite non-human companion to a person ever, Panda. Yep. I'm going to let you guys talk about this because... I believe I am one of the few people that uh, didn't enjoy this release at all. Oh, yeah. okay. <clears throat> I thought it was uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I liked it. I mean, I liked the I liked the relationship between um, 
Hex and Iris, and and I and I like the banter between them. Um, Ace and uh, <clears throat> and Panda, and and it was good to find out finally what Panda was. You know that yeah. he's actually a, you know a cyborg, and that he was, you know, they were made for children for uh, as like a teaching uh, tool. Um, yeah. So that was you know good to finally find out. Because I'd always wondered, you know, from the Iris audios, what the hell? Why Why was she going around with an anthropomorphic stuffed six-inch high panda as a companion? So it was kind of good to get some clarification on that. Yes. Yeah, the premise was a bit odd with the whole artist thing and, you know, disappearing. And, 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 and I'm not up on art, so I don't really know much about, you know, Salvador Dali and... and, and whoever else was in the mentioned in the you know in the in the story but i just thought it was a good kind of fun romp mm. uh and i love the fact that it was kind of for the longest time iris versus the doctor um yeah uh, and i, I like the interplay between mccoy and uh katie manning oh these look like old diaries how I single-handedly defeated the Dalek invasion of Earth in the 22nd century and then kicked their so-called master plan into touch. <laughs> Did she? Of course uh. not. And then I met six of my previous incarnations in the universe of antimatter, which turns out to be completely full of aunties, what? <laughs> she makes half of this stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's yeah. good fun, that release. I, again... Really didn't enjoy it. Um, Panda, I, I don't understand the interest or fascination with Panda. He's the, just, he's just the, funny. The, it just, but the, it's just the fact that he's a six mm. inch high anthropomorphic panda that likes going around and basically shagging anything that moves and basically getting pissed with Iris on a regular basis. It's just mm. quite funny. Um, hmm. So, yeah, he's just a bit of a. Yeah. I don't know. To me, I kind of see Panda as a bit of a kind of a, a modern Byron. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he's just a bit of a rebel, really. Um, uh, and and just well, he's a rebel, but all when when all, all said and done, you know, he's kind of on the good side. He yeah. just likes a party. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't enjoy it. How and uh, Sylvester McCoy's words can uh, sum up this whole episode for me. I have to admit, I'm surprised and strangely disappointed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's like exactly that how I, I felt about the Muse of Fire. Surprised because I was really looking forward to Hex and strangely disappointed. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what would you guys give uh, the Muse of Fire? Um, I'd give it a good 8 out of 10. I would say probably an 8 out of 10 because I really enjoyed it. It was a good, good romp. Just... Uh, generally a good story so yeah that's what i'd give it yeah i i think i'd give it a about a four just really didn't enjoy it too much uh re-listen value really low again i'm strangely disappointed uh next the main range also secondary <laughs> release for the month of december was the hunting ground this is episode 246 featuring colin baker as the doctor no real companion that we are familiar with from his uh, TARDIS crew takes place in Iceland. And I don't know if uh, I was just in some sort of funk when I was listening to both this one and the Muse of Fire, but I didn't enjoy this one either. Um, I enjoyed it, but it was a bit odd. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't understand the whole Icelandic thing of, every, of everyone every, everyone being called Stotia at the end, and whether the, I I don't know whether that was explained in the extras or was it was it was it Stotia Jotia? No, it was Stotia because they were somebody's daughter. It it was briefly explained in episode two, I think. Was it okay? I totally missed that because I was like, why are there two characters called blah 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 Stotia? I was like, what? Like wh why they can't both be called Stotia? Surely they're not related. So I, I kind of couldn't figure that out. But um, uh, what I found a bit odd was the fact that, like, you have this police detective and, you know, people. And then you've got them going, oh, but there's people that go troll hunting. And and it's yes. like, uh, OK, fine. I, 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 am, I am one for missing legends. I, I, I 
you know, I believe in, in various, um, shall we say, phenomena in that regard. But to kind of have the two meet in such a, quote, grounded way mm -hmm. was just a little bit strange. And that's probably due to kind of our Western sort of approach on things and the fact that we don't appreciate or have people go, oh, yeah, I'm just popping into the new forest to look for fairies. You know what I mean? It just doesn't uh -huh. happen. Um, so, yeah, and I think I think that the reason why that kind of threw me a bit, I suppose, was just the whole cultural difference. And I, I my knowledge of Iceland and their culture is very limited. So I think if I was from that culture, I perhaps would have appreciated the story a little bit more than I did. Mm -hmm. Purely because he's just so different, and I don't yeah. know any of the legends, so I, I, yeah, I wouldn't say I struggled because it wasn't a hard story, but it was just unusual. Yeah, I, I personally really enjoyed it, but then I'm familiar with sort of Norse mythology anyway. So. I mean, I understood the whole, you know, the whole Yule lads, you know, the thirteen troll things. Uh, I knew about mm. that, but that's just, that's as far as my knowledge goes with Icelandic legend and i don't know just the whole the whole thing with the whole inspector and the printer and i was just like what was yeah, that, was that really about uh, what that, ma that made me laugh when uh he made the print uh the printer uh what sing or play music or whatever that mm. that made me laugh yeah but uh, it yeah, for me personally, it was not an interesting story. It did not keep hold my attention. I would have to give it a five. It, it, to me personally, re-listen value relatively low. I, if I had to choose between that, this one and the Shield of Jotun, hmm. I would be in stalemate for quite some time because I don't know which one I would rather re-listen to <laughs> first. Because neither one of them were. I I do enjoy reading our friend's uh, post on uh, uh, Amazon.com about the Shield of Jot, and that's enjoyable. But um, mm. besides that, no. Huh. Fair enough. I'd give it, yeah. So five for me. What about you guys? Again, about an eight for me. Because I really enjoyed it myself. I thought it was a really good story. I would have said maybe 5.5. You know, not bad, but not not yeah. stand out either. Next, uh, one of the few releases I haven't listened to for the month of December, The Crash of the UK 201. This is written by Jonathan Morris, who's one of my favorite writers. Mm -hmm. This features Marina O'Hara as Vicky, Peter Purvis as Stephen Taylor, and The Doctor. And, yeah, I know nothing about this story, so... Do you mean go. Marina O'Brien? Yeah, that's what I meant. Um, it wasn't bad. It was a bit, for me, it lagged because it was kind of repeating itself a lot of the time because it was yeah. a typical, you know, time, you know, going back and changing things and it was all right, it, but it was, it, it seemed to drag in the end, kind of pointless. Well, we know, well, you kind of know what kind of happens, you know, it, it, Everything had to get resolved because otherwise, if it didn't, you know, Vicky wouldn't have existed, and and neither would you know, and Stephen wouldn't have come into contact with the Doctor and various things. So it was kind of a bit of a, you know, just a typical time goes screwy. They have to fix it, otherwise, nothing would happen from that point. Yeah. So for me, re-listen value quite low. I'd I'd give it a three. I'd probably give it a five. So, yeah, because it was okay, but nothing groundbreaking. It was nowhere near like you know, Dark Invasion of Winter and oh, you know, you know, that kind of you know level. Mm. Let's see. I haven't listened right. to Survivors yet because I want to wait for Series Nine, and I was going to marathon them because, well, I'm guessing it you ends know on, what on a cliffhanger, and you have made the best choice of doing that because right now it is so insane in survivor land in box set or series eight. <coughs> I, yeah, Oh yes. I will say personally, 
and I I've, I love the characters. Personally, at least in episode one, Abby is really starting to get on my nerves. Mm. I understand she's a mother. I understand she's looking for her son, but she's getting on my nerves because she's basically holding herself hostage because you know she's hopeful and you know what good for her that she she's holding out hope that he's still alive but she puts the entire crew in jeopardy because of her hope hmm. and it's like how how often it, 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 i i would put myself like in jenny's shoes or some of these other people's shoes would I want to constantly be around somebody who at any moment would tell me, stop firing, stop protecting ourselves because Peter might be over in that group. Mm. And yes. I, 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 I'm at least in episode one, personally, I, f I found her nearly un uh, intolerable. Mm. Intolerable. But yeah. it is a great series I will not say a single thing about you. You are right. It does end on a cliffhanger. I am eagerly anticipating June's release of Series 9. It is going to be insane. I hmm. cannot wait. And it will be interesting to see what they do with the range next because that's the last box set, but they've said it isn't, isn't the end for the series. So No. In fact, we still have What's-Her-Face that um, – was going to America. Maddie, so yeah. I, I, I want Chase to return because I like mm -hmm. Chase Masterson, so Yeah. Um <clears throat> so yeah, I, I will hold off until June. <laughs> so the last one for the month of December and the last of two thousand eighteen is the War Master, the Master of Callus. I'm in two minds about this box set. Uh because it was definitely a slow burner. Yes. I don't know if I like the fact that it's a slow burner or not. I don't think I do. But I must say I'm surprised at how ruthless he is and how kind of just out and out evil he is. I mean, the fact that he basically makes three people commit suicide just on the telephone. Yes. In the first episode it was like, holy uh -huh. shit, like this, this master uh -huh. is taken to a new level and the fact of just how he kills one of the people at the end of the final story and just walks off that's like wow like okay that's just pretty grim and i love the final scene i did not see that one coming and it, it it's quite cool because i like the fact that he mentions the chameleon arch i didn't realize that he had it in his tardis all along you know so again, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a nice callback to episode four of series one of, of his yes. box set. And I'm really looking forward to series three and having him meet uh, the Eighth Doctor. What about you, Humphrey? I Master of Callus. I haven't heard um, the second box set yet. I recently heard the first box set because I hadn't really got into the War Master before. So mm -hmm. I've only heard uh, box set one. Um, but I will be hearing it, and by all accounts, it looks really exciting, actually. I enjoyed box set one, so mm. I should enjoy two. So I re-listened. I, I was trying to figure out if my memory was serving me correct regarding our um, my, my thoughts on the first Master box set. So I listened to episode 73, I believe it was, where mm. we did a whole... Uh, year in retrospect <laughs> and i i still have the same belief regarding the war master box set that i still do i personally believe the first box set was dull and uninspiring and at the time if you want to go back and listen to it i basically said i'm rooting for no further box sets war master i've listened to two and a half episodes only the good if they don't do another box set i think i'm fine with that it was an okay uh, adventure, but it never really gripped me that much. Yeah, but you've not finished it, so you can't really... 
So, post-production update. This is February 8th, 2018. I have listened to the Wardmaster box set, all four episodes, and I stand by my original opinion of kind of hoping that we don't see a second box set. Not that interesting, and also still stand by that the Unbound Doctor in the Unbound Universe, because that's what it's called, is still not part of canon. It is. So, here we go. So, we have three more. I listened to this one. I found Master of Callus even more dull than before. In fact, I was pretty set fast that I was not going to purchase box set three. And then my brain went, oh, but he meets the eighth doctor. And I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> Crap. I must admit, I go, in you, big, big finish, you suck. You absolutely suck because I was about done. I was done with Ravenous because mm. of that. The, I, because Ravenous 2, to me personally, sucked. And I was like, I'm done with Ravenous. I'm, I don't care how this turns out. And then they're like, oh, by the way, Charlotte Pod's coming back. I was, Crap. <laughs> <laughs> you a- oh. <laughs> you suck, Big Finish. You absolutely <laughs> suck. Uh, I was gonna, I was done with the War Master, and then you pull me in with that. I was done with Ravenous, and you pull me in with that. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, I pre-ordered both of them, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. Um, and I must admit, well, should we should we actually move on to uh, Diary of River Song because we've just bet- spoken about yes. the War Master. Uh, Ooh, because actually, yes. I must admit, the I was surprised at the ending of of War Master, uh, of, well, no, War, uh, Diary of River Song, <laughs> with, with with the the War Master in it, because he is turning into a really good incarnation. Yes. So me. well, let, let's go to that. So in so we're now in 2019. Yay! Um, so. To discuss the the Diary of River Song series five, this features four masters. In this, the first one is let's see who was it? Missy. Oh, it was Missy. The Bechtel test. We uh, written by Jonathan Morris. The next one is Animal Instinct, featuring the Jeffrey Beavers master. Then we have Lifeboat, feature with written by Eddie Robson, which features uh, Eric uh, Roberts. And, L- Lifeboat and the Death Boat. Yeah, lifeboat and the death boat, and then concealed weapons, which features the war master. <clears throat> so, let's see. I'm gonna play this first drop. This is from. In fact, I will say just before I play this. At first, when Michelle Gomez made her appearance as Missy, I felt as though she was very wooden, very not into the audio medium, and then as it progressed. I don't know if it was just me or she became more c- accustomed to doing it, but she started sounding like the Missy from the TV series rather mm. than somebody sounding like Missy who's reading things off of a script. But here's uh, his first part. No time, Lord. The Doctor's first crush at the Academy. Yes, he told me about you. Nothing good, I hope. No, nothing good. And he told me... You were dead. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. He's he's made that mistake before, eighty-five times. A self-proclaimed designation, which is assumed to be an alias. Oh, I should have guessed straight away. Yes. Yep. You're right. It's me. The Rani. <laughs> what? The Rani, the Doctor's old friend from the Academy. What? You said you were a Time Lord. Who else could you be? Oh. You're not Romana, are you? No, I am not Romana. So you must be the Rani, unless... <gasps> oh, do I hear the soft tinkle of a penny dropping? But if you're... <laughs> well, you're not quite as the doctor described. No? No. He said you were a man for a start. Oh, that. Yes. It's not really a big change, though, is it? Although, I have found I'm more of a hat person now. I mean, <laughs> you think it would be shoes, but no, suddenly I'm all about the hats. So what do you call yourself now? I mean, you can't really keep calling yourself the monk. Well, I... The monk? 
<laughs> the monk? Right, that's it. I'm gonna pull your head off right here, right now. Come on. Oh, it's all right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That was, I th thought that was so enjoyable. I mean, here you have like these two like sociopaths yeah. and River just like taunting Missy the entire time. That was so awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I thought that the, the dialogue was, was pretty inspired there, to be fair. And, and no, actually, uh, Missy, like I said before, she, yeah, she surprised me. Uh, because I mean, I I wasn't the best fan of her in the TV show. I mean, the, the whole oh here, Doctor, have a Cyberman army. What? What yeah. are you doing? W why? No, go away. Yeah, she was su surprisingly enjoyable. <clears throat> well, no, and not and here it, basically, I was on the having not liked either one of the War Master box sets. I was pretty content. <clears throat> that I was not going to pick up the Missy box set. However, listening to that <laughs> and also looking at two of the writers for the Missy box set, seeing that Nev Fountain is writing for Missy, hmm. basically sold me right there. <laughs> I knew you would say that. And then, and then seeing Jonathan Morris as one of the other writers, I was just like, "Okay, that's okay." Nev Fountain, right there. I have not heard anything from you since what? Uh, what was it? Uh, one of the main the, ranges. Widow's Assassin. Yeah. yeah, the Widow's Assassin. I don't think he's written for a Big Finish since mm -hmm. then. And the instant I saw Nev Fountain's name right there, it's like, "Okay, picking up Missy Series One." <laughs> the, 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 it, it, <laughs> Nev Fountain's writing will be worth maybe. You know, if there's three other crappy stories, his writing will be worth the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I've bre I'm just picturing just kind of lightning bolts just over your head and just you turning green and just growing muscles <laughs> at this point. No, I, I was pleasantly surprised by that story. And it, it was just fun, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, and then what was it? Here's the parting moments from that one, which, um, again, shows really how complex river is and when you really think about the, especially the classic series how the master is his timeline is relatively uncomplex Oops. well well yeah if i was going to kill you you'd already be dead yeah, so why haven't you well because you're a complex space-time event <laughs> while i have had the common decency to try meet the doctor in chronological order you've been bouncing up and down his time stream willy-nilly your timelines are inextricably entwined one little tug in the wrong place and the whole causal nexus could be unraveled oh and you don't do that oh no 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 there's nothing i'd like more but only if the doctor is in the same room i'd have to see the the funny old look on his face. Otherwise, there'd be absolutely no point. That's why you never asked me if the Doctor's still alive. Because you think he is. I, I, I was... I mean, we've already known that River's timeline is just all over the place. But mm. when you think about the Master meeting the Third Doctor and basically how sequential every single thing is in the classic series, and even up until the new series... The Master's timeline is, but I mean, until you throw in uh, Alex McQueen, mm. his timeline is relatively simple. Yeah, because apparently the, uh, because apparently you know what we thought was a regeneration, was a body swap. Yeah, which like ah oh, god damn it! So we don't actually see um, an actual regeneration, and the first apparently the first chronological appearance of McQueen. Was in uh, Dark Eyes Two. The, the is it Death of oh, Hope? Yes, that's technically his first actual chronological appearance hmm. in that incarnation. I'd like to see him and Missy sort of meeting. I think that would be quite mm. exciting. Yeah, uh, I was a bit, I was a bit disappointed that, that the McQueen wasn't in this box set. I would have preferred to have seen McQueen rather than um, Beavers, if I'm honest. I think the Beaver story was the weakest one out of the four. I, I, see, I don't know, you see. Um, Actually, it, to me, it, it, 
and here actually here's what I'll say. I think the Beaver story was the weakest one out of the four. The one with Eric Roberts in it, I didn't really like his acting. I didn't see he did not seem natural. It wasn't a fit. You could definitely tell by his speech pattern that he is aged and he has, you know, teeth replacements and and stuff like that. He does not speak well. I didn't mind him. I don't know what it was about that story. I I knew he, I knew that you know he was the master straight away. Oh yeah. I love the explanation. And it's the same. Did, did you see my oh, tweets? Too. Just one second. Looking for this room. I didn't steal this. The doctor wanted rid of me. Oh really? The number of times he's bent over backwards to help you when you didn't deserve it. You can't always trust the doctor's versions of events. Oh, I know, but I trust his a lot more than yours. I fell into the eye of harmony. What? A and you survived? I always... Oh, you always survive. Yes, of course you do. The eye tried to break me down into pure energy, but it's also connected to every other part of the TARDIS. So I was able to ride the energy wave down to a spare room to protect itself. The doctor's TARDIS detached the room. And set it adrift in the vortex. Why did you pick me up? To save your life. Now, no. You only did it because you thought I could help you. No. And because I was bored in one of the company. Alison's very so, sulky. Uh, now, uh, yeah, now, I did it, see now, your tweet to Jonathan Morris. Yeah, interestingly. And uh, basically what, what he said was that... And this has been taken into account, apparently. And Matt Fitton also confirmed this. I didn't get it confirmed by him, but I, can't remember, I think someone said on the fan page that basically the master's consciousness has been split. Hence why the Eric Roberts one is still around and hence why the events from Mastermind are still considered canon and why the, you know, morphant worm thing uh, saves the beaver's master and that's why he ends up in 1906 new york and, and and all that so basically this point there's two bits of the master going hmm. around which mm. is weird so and, and like i said apparently that that has been taken into account i personally would like to see more from eric roberts as the master because well because he's he's you know we've seen the least of so yes. I, I i do want to see more of I did think, though, however, the story wasn't that interesting, which was a shame because I wanted to see what he could do. And. Oops, sorry. And sorry. and Continue. and it wasn't kind of, you know, I, I don't think really the master got much room to really flex his muscles, as it were. Uh, yeah. Which was a shame because I was really, really hoping, for, you know, more from that story personally. Uh, like the, I, you know, I do like the the explanation though of how he survived. That was quite ingenious. Yes, mm -hmm. but I just didn't think the story was that good. And then the last one, a concealed weapon, which again, one of the things that that was nice about that one is the master was gone or not present for most of it. Yeah, uh... and you just were waiting when he was gonna make an appearance. Yeah, yeah, and that that was brilliant and. When he did, it was just like, oh, my God. And just you just didn't know what he was going to do next, did you? No. And and that's what I mean. Derek Jacobi, for me, has become really, 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 really ruthless as the master and an enjoyable character to actually listen to. Uh, even though, like I said, Master of Callus wasn't that great. I still prefer the first box over the second. But there's just moments. I would, I would agree with that. Because uh, here's my thoughts on the Master of Callus, because I didn't make a mention of this. I found, and I don't even think we gave reviews for the Master of Callus, but I found, especially the first story of Master of Callus, basically like Colony in Space, minus uh -huh. the Doctor, and instead of a mysterious creature that is, uh, you know, basically murdering people uh, at nighttime, you have an Ood with a phone. I have a call. I'm sorry? I have a call. Because, I mean, th th they even have the same mining group from Colony in Space. They Do even they? have, like, kind of a similar similar pre premise to oh. Colony in Space, minus the hippie nat uh, natives that landed there first. Yeah, I didn't... 
see, I wasn't interested in, in the mining group. Uh, none of the characters really, really grabbed me. Uh, what I did like, however, was how he tied everything up at the end. You know, how he basically manipulated the two main, was it lovers? Mm-hmm. Or sisters? Yes. That was, I, yeah, sisters. Yeah. That was, that was great. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved his performance as that weird old creepy cannibal guy in that weird machine thing. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the way he, you know, he finished off, you know, he finished off that governor and just walked out and just, just strolled away and rocks up on that planet with Narvin. It was, was, was great. Which again, uh, the, that whole Narvin setup was perfect for his appearance in the Time War one box set, the the Gallifrey. <coughs> yeah. That, that that was that was perfect. Yeah. Uh but no, I think Derek Jacobi is is fast becoming quite a, a dangerous incarnation. I think the McQueen Master is to me the the more the evilest one because you can get a sense he he gets a sick enjoyment out of things. I mean, not to say that the War Master doesn't, the, the, the Derek Jacoby doesn't, mm. but I feel as though you he there's so much pleasure in every last moment of misery that he causes. I don't know. I think I think Jacoby though is. I think he does give him. I, I think he does give him a run for his money in the sense that he is just so charming you know i think i think scott is right when he's when he says he's basically kind of like like hannibal lecter you know he's got that mm. charm uh, now to him. that is perfect that is a perfect uh comparison that hannibal lecter he, that the charm but yet the the monstrous uh personality also um, yeah. yeah yeah underneath and, and i think that really does suit jacoby's incarnation uh, whereas i think mcqueen has just kind of got that you know he's got that glib of sanity but just underneath he's just that pure psychosis Mm. Um, whereas I think jacoby has got more of a control on it and it's, it's, it's just under there, but he's, he's trying to put on a, you know, he puts on a very, 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 very good facade and, you know, fits into society, you know, uh, like a, you know, a very well-oiled psychopath and yes. brings it out as and when he wants to, which again, I think is scarier because you just don't know when he's going to bring it out. And when he does, you're like, oh, shit, you know? And that's, mm-hmm. that's I think, in some respects, scarier than, say, McQueen, because you know he's just nuts. Mm. Yes. And that's what I mean. That's what I, again, for me, the Beavers is good, and I, and I do enjoy Beavers acting, and, and you know, he's, a, he's a, a lovely bloke. But I think that, that incarnation of the Master is quite one-dimensional. Uh, so for me, is is it is very kind of, you know, oh, ha, 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 pantomime, villain, evil. But... Poor mustache. Yeah, and 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 I and I just think that with Jacoby, you just you have no clue when it's coming and when it. Well, comes. I think you, you, McQueen, you... Ha- you have no clue either because <laughs> he, he promises survivors and then he basically will like kill everybody except one person. He says, "I promised a survivor." Mm. Mm. Yeah, but I mean that that's the difference though between between McQueen and Jacoby. Jacoby just like, eh, ah, uh, well. I didn't lie, but I didn't tell the whole truth. And just, you know, like, you can tell his pleasure's less kind of, you know, psychotic laughter and, and, and whatever. It's just more measured. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's that's what I think is scarier because he doesn't really laugh. He's And, oh, no, the bit that got me was just that bit where he's just being tortured and he's just pissing himself laughing. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just like, yeah, he's definitely gone a bit nuts. <laughs> yeah. I will say... And you might disagree with me, but, mm. and I even have the sound that I'd like to play for you. However, I, w- one of the best moments, I actually paused, stood up, threw my fist in the air, pulled it down, and yell- bellowed out a loud yes, because the last part of Concealed Weapon, basically, River explains why the two masters premise sucked <laughs> here is the sound this master who calls himself the master anyway and in that one question you summed him up seriously though who is he he's a time lord a renegade 
and not even one of the fun, nice Time Lord renegades, which is probably quite telling given how bad their reputation is right now. You mean the war? Not that the Master takes sides. He's only ever out for himself. That's why he calls himself the Master. Because on some sad, pathetic level, he genuinely believes he deserves to come out on top. Worse still, he could be right. How do you mean? I mean, he's smart, patient, devious. He can get inside people's heads and make them do terrible things. Sometimes his ego gets in the way of things, but even then, he's factored all that into his scheme. Aha! And that's my favorite part of that whole thing, is he's evil, his ego gets in the way, and he's factored in everything, except in the two masters, his ego, which basically, to me, again, highlights why the two masters sucks. <laughs> <laughs> eh, I still like it as a release. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what I liked about Concealed Weapon was the fact that River basically got <laughs> over by the Master at that point. Yeah. You know, she she did. Yeah, win. she did. She did. Well, she thinks she won, but she didn't technically. Well, she got out alive. That's a win. Yeah, she got out alive, but <laughs> she still got like screwed over memory wise. I will say, and here's the thing that I would like to be included in a uh, future time war box set because um with this last episode with the Derek Jacobi master he explains basically kind of what he was doing on that ship his purpose for being there his purpose for um, doing a certain thing and here I, I would like to throw this out because I want you to listen to this because I this is what I would like to who would I'd like would like to make an appearance in future uh Gallifrey Time War box sets. There's a difference between stopping the war and winning. Alas, both the Daleks and the Time Lords are now getting desperate. Desperate enough to begin conducting experiments. Their genetic scientists are splicing life form after life form with the space time vortex itself, producing devastating creatures that should never have even been possible. Oh, and let me guess. You want to put an end to that? Not at all, my dear. I want to get in on the action. But first, I needed a little genetic material of my own. Hence, our mutual See, friend here. The master getting in on that, that is one thing. But the person yeah. who is really into science, the person who's really into genetic manipulation, it's is the Rani. The Rani. I would love for the Ronnie to make an appearance in Gallifrey Time War or mm. uh, the Fourth Doctor or the Eighth Doctor Time War series yeah. because that's what she specializes in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, apparently, that story is going to tie into the third War Master box set. The events you see mm. in that story are part of a bigger picture. Interesting. Apparently, <clears throat> so we will see more of that. And what his actual plan was for that in uh, the third War Master box set. So, what would you give the River Song series five? Uh, mm, tough one, tough one, tough one, tough one. I I probably say I'd give it a good eight, eight out of ten. I mean, it was enjoyable. You know, there were some great bits of dialogue from all all the masters in there. Uh, I I I I'm I'm not why why I'm not giving it higher is just because it's a bit of a shame about. The uh, Eric Roberts story because I, I really yes. wanted more from that and from from that incarnation, um, mm. and I just hope they get more of him. I yeah, eight, eight out of ten it, it would be perfect because uh, to me the the Missy story blew my socks off. I don't know if it was because I wasn't <coughs> expecting much or I was expecting worse, mm. but the Missy story blew my socks off. But yeah, you are right. The Eric Roberts one, kind of a little uninspiring. Personally, the Jeffrey Beaver story, kind of a little l little bit of like, a, I, I felt as though it had some similarity. It started the similarity to one of the first uh, Diary of River Song box set when uh, they're in that uh, tomb. Uh, that was, that uh, was the very first story in the very first box set. Yes. With um, Alexander Vlahos. Exactly. I, I will say... I think this is my second favorite Diary of a River, River Song box set. I think the first one is still the best. I don't know, I don't know where I'd put the rest of them, but I think yeah. this is my second favorite uh, Diary box set. What, what what would you think? That's a tough one. I, I don't know. Um, I quite like it because it was you know got the master in. Like I said, it's got you know 
at least two very strong stories and, you know, one that's not too bad. Yeah. So, I mean, the only one I could think that would come close would be the third one with uh, the fifth doctor as well as Madame, C- whatever mm-hmm. her name is. I, some of her stories are kind of up and down. The fourth one I really had a hard time with. As much yeah. as I like the fourth doctor, I had a hard time with that one. I like some of the stories in there, like that one. You know, the, the, the one with the restaurant was just hilarious. But that was in th- three. Oh, was it in three? Was it? Yeah, that was with three, where uh, it was the time restaurant where. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what was four again? Four was the. Four was the weird one with those like uh, the Discordia. Oh God! Yeah. Oh yeah, that was a bit meh. Yeah, I didn't particularly care for no. them, but no. yeah. I, I think if I had had to rank, it would be one, five, three, two, four. I'd say probably, I'd probably say five first and then, I don't know, three. And yeah. then we didn't really rate or discuss, or I, I don't think we gave our thoughts on the Master of Callus, what we would give it. Oh, God, that's a tough one. Um, that is a tough one. See, because there's, there's 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 moments where I was just like, "Wow, that's just awesome," but overall, I I, I didn't really like it. No, I I want to either say a five or a four. four. I just yeah, I'd say four. Yeah, it was uninspiring. Like I say, I, I some believe. bits of dialogue were fantastic, and some moments were mm-hmm. like, "Wow, how you know, holy shit!" But on the whole, it wasn't. There, there was not n- enough. No, I think to hold it up high i i think because mm, mm. yeah you, you, you do make a good point there are some moments where you're just like oh my word that's uh, insane or oh my word that's amazing but how you got there was slow mm. yeah and then you know you have that whole thing where the phone's ringing and you're like i'm not going to answer the phone and then you have the ood oh but you will answer the phone one day and you're just like oh, c- come on mm. Get- do something. Yeah. Next. I have not listened to the first Doctor Box set, so... I've listened um, to the first story. I'm, I haven't finished the second one yet, so I think we should leave that. Both of these, uh, it, it, you know, you know my feelings for the fourth, the first Doctor mm. as portrayed by David Bradley because Stephen Moffat yeah. ruined I that. Found, I found the first story, I found the companions... As, no, sorry, not, not the companions, the characters in it very whiny. Oh, really? I don't know much about the Phoenicians, um, it was mm-hmm. interesting to find out about them as a, as a as a nation. Don't get me wrong, uh-huh. but I just found the brother and sister oh, just annoying. Mm. Very very whiny. I want to. I really want to get into because that's a shame. Because I was really looking forward to the Phoenicians. I was gonna put my the the issues that I have regarding the characters that don't sound like the characters, but you know, on the bright side, they look like the characters. Mm. Uh, aside and. You know the. I mean, do it. Cause horrible it is, it portrayal. And, you know, Susan gets some good, gets some good moments. Yeah, I was hoping for something for the Phoenicians, and I and but I'm really interested in the TikTok world because uh, Guy Adams is just blowing things out of the park with his writing, and then again you have Caroline Ford, who is the woman, and mm. what's going on with that? Yeah. So, so moving on from that, because we can't really give reviews for that since we haven't listened to the whole thing. Um, countermeasures. I have not no, listened to that I one. Either. Okay, moving on. Fourth Doctor Adventures. Yeah, listen to. Okay, so did I. So the first one. See the sinister and, uh, uh, kill. Yeah, sinister and kill. This, in fact, I was surprised. I thought this story was going to take place between. <coughs> the deadly assassin mm. and the face of evil and it is not it's invasion of time isn't it i was surprised i really was in fact i immediately went and started watching the first episode of a key to time i was just curious mm. how they were going to make this work because just from that scene you would assume because at the very end of uh, invasion of time he the doctor is staring at the camera laughing as he has a box entitled uh canine mark two mm. and then the first thing that you see in a key to time is him on all fours w- blowing a dog whistle 
essentially you'd assume between that those time er that time period he just assembled it however this fits perfectly he's already mm. assembled he's just i don't know fine tuning it or refixing it or something like that yeah. it does work it does yeah yeah which is really good and i must admit i do like and i do like Anne kelso she's a oh yeah oh yes I, in fact to, to me personally the shame about her is I wish this was kind of the character that Constance was. Because I really like, I can't think of the actress's name, but I really like the actress who plays Constance. But I just don't like the time period which she came from. Granted, her background story was great with Bletchley Hall. But, Mm. yeah, Bletchley Park. But... To have a World War II person, you know, if if this story took place in like either the 60s or the 70s, I think it would be okay for a World War II character to be in existence. But, you know, we are 70 years past World War II. As, as great as that time era was and as great as the people and men and women that served and lived in that time era were, I would rather have had Constance be the kind of character that Anne was or is. Yeah, I like I like Anne, and I think uh, Jane Slavin brings her to life beautifully. Actually, what? So the first story, the 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 Sinestrin kill, is written by Andrew Smith. The introductory story to Jane Slavin's uh, portrayal of the companion between Leela and Romana One is Anne Kelso. I I enjoyed this. It was it was fun. Yeah, it was just a a good romp, wasn't it? That one. And then you had the the next story, the Planet the of the Drashics, which we're here now, a breathable atmosphere. So let's go outside, eh? Well, where's here? We don't know what's out there. Oh, nothing dangerous, I'm sure. See, looks innocuous. Looks damp. Oh, you're from England. You'll feel at home. You were supposed to be taking me away from home. Look, are you always this pernickety? Pernickety. Yes, pernickety. It depends. Does the TARDIS often deposit you at some mystery location? Affirmative. Right, you're not coming out, K-9. Stay here till we get back. After watching it, uh, listening to this, I had to go back and re-watch Carnival of Monsters <laughs> because See, I, I needed to... Uh... I was a bit annoyed that they, they never they never described the Drashigs on audio. And my collection comprises every species, uh, from the familiar giant wetland Drashig to the albino burrowing Drashig of the desert. To the deadliest of all, and my personal favourite, the small emerald trashing of the rainforest. Uh, They're feeding. Turn on the monitor. Cameras activated. They're hunting. A goat. Hardly a challenge for an emerald. Sector three. I see. Out of interest, how would you describe an emerald trashing? I've been practising for the inspector. Clever. Deadly. I was thinking along the lines of, um, while far from the largest of Drashig species, the emerald is demonstrably the smartest. Lithe pack hunters coordinating their attacks perfectly with a finesse sense of smell and teeth that can devour every last part of their prey. Always the showman, Bray. So for me, it was a bit of a disappointment, actually, that story, in a way. Because, I mean, that's what I mean. I I, I have no concept of of what they look like anyway. Kind of dragony... Ex- they they move like inchworms, at least on Carnival of Monsters. They're relatively yeah. slow. I was actually kind of hoping that it kind of would be like a a call a further callbacks to Carnival of Monsters because that was kind of a, that's a fun story. Yeah, it was more kind of Jurassic Park esque, wasn't it? More than anything else. yes, yes, it was Jurassic Park esque. Mm. Then you have the Enchantress of Numbers. That was interesting. Actually. Yeah, yeah, I liked that I, one. It was weird, but it was interesting. I didn't know that Ada Lovelace was Byron's daughter. That was, um, <laughs> yeah, again, that was just a good kind of... Uh, it definitely had its comedy moments, but it was a slow burner, but interestingly not boring. No. It wouldn't have worked if it hadn't been a slow burner, actually. Mm. Um, and then the last one, The False Guardian... Which mm. leaves us on a cliffhanger for a little bit. I'm not sure what I think about the False Guardian. I will say I think personally, the out of all four stories, I think the the 
the story that was the I wouldn't say low point, but out of all four, the the story that I would rank the the lowest would be the Enchantress of Numbers. And I think I would rank the introductory one, the Sinestrin kill, as the high point, as well as the... I would have said Planet of the Drashigs for me was the low, was, was the low point. Mm, I'd say I enjoyed it, but it's the least good of the th- of the four. For me, anyway, I quite I quite enjoyed the Enchantress of Numbers, and, and the False Guardian was interesting. I mean, I totally missed them saying, oh... Uh, Zephon, son of Zephon. I was like, oh, okay, because I thought at the end that, that was Mavic Chen. I, I I like the fact that guy thinks he's Mavic Chen, but he's actually had a breakdown. <laughs> yeah. This guy called Nigel. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was fantastic, um, and I love the fact that it's set on Kemble as well. That's quite so do I. I I I love that it's set on Kemble. I really like the I because you still not because we you, after the first Doctor left with Stephen. <laughs> In the end of the uh, Daleks' master plan, you have no idea what the repercussions of the time destructor still running until it basically ran out of juice. So Mm -hmm. it's quite interesting that you have this wave of chronon energy that, and then this uh, protective barrier, as well as, and I'm really kind of curious because one of the things that I enjoy is I believe it was in Dalek Empire 3 when they had those like mutated running um oh what are they the 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 plant creatures I can't think of what the vagas the vaga plants where they kind of mutated them to like where they were actually able to not just like inch along but they were able to run sprint and basically mm. like within moments of being touched you or you were either eaten or you were uh, morphing into one immediately. I'm really curious what they're going to be doing with these Varga plants because, again, they're on a time... They're on a planet that had the time destructor go off. Perhaps it has created some sort of evolution towards them. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really curious to find out how this whole cliffhanger will end for 8B that comes out this month in February. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um and I don't know. I thought I thought actually it's this it's been the strongest set for the fourth doctor in, in in a while actually for me. Um I would agree with that because last year we had those the first four that the first two were okay and then there was that two parter that you and me both decided that we had no interest in finding out how the second part ended. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like Anne. Um, I hope she survives because I, I want to see more from her. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, isn't it? Isn't series nine? Uh, is Leela again? Yeah. Uh, no, series nine is um Adric and Romana. Oh, that's right. And, and ten. Right. And ten is Leela. And I guess to end the whole month of february or not february january of 2019 is the main range devil in the mist episode 247 featuring mm-hmm. the the doctor tegan turlo and chameleon yep. i in really enjoyed this episode i do will say I'm really hoping that Chameleon... I know he's going to be in for two more stories, but you can't have a companion on board that is easily manipulated to turning over to the evil side like that. I, because, mm. it, I mean, it's you can't trust him at any point in time. Because think about it. Whose will is more strong? And uh, uh, the will of somebody who's good or the will that somebody's evil. I feel as though the will of somebody who's evil would like overpower however good somebody is. And he would constantly be taken over and essentially like betraying the TARDIS crew every single time. Mm. Mm. I think that that's my biggest problem with Chameleon uh, making a comeback is I'm not sure what he's kind of like a one trick pony. Yeah, he can morph into something, but usually the predominantly 
strong-willed person takes over his will. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I quite liked uh, Chameleon, though. I mean, I, in the sense that it was good to have him back. I thought John Coltrane did a really good job. Oh yeah, I like those hippo creatures too. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were interesting. Uh, Tegan got on my nerves a bit, though. Uh, I felt she was very whiny. I mean, un- understandable, but still very whiny. I will say one of my favorite things that she said was uh, regarding, like, you know, you can't trust Chameleon because he was, uh, you know, because th- this is post, I think, it is post uh, King's, King's Demons. Demons. It is post King's Demons, yeah. And, you know, he's like, well, he, he was controlled by the master. And then he, she was trashing Turlo and Turlo walks in and she just like looked at him. She's so like, what? Like you know, uh huh. I don't trust you either. <laughs> you don't like it? Drop dead. <laughs> yeah. And was it me or what happened to the mist creature? Because one minute he was there, and the next minute he just wasn't. Or if I missed something entirely. Uh, let's see. Well, um, Humphrey, you might want to either turn away from the phone for a while or, uh. It- have this part of the story spoiled because I will answer your question. Oh, uh, spoilers don't phase me. So <laughs> okay, um, when the spaceship crash landed on the planet, he died on impact. Oh. Okay. Huh. It was the will of Tegan's distrust of Chameleon and worrying about the mist creature that caused Chameleon to be the mist creature. Okay. Mm-hmm. Weird. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. And to, Which again to be kinda fair, goes to the Yeah. Sorry. And and to be fair though, I, I could kind of see the whole that Commander Hippo thing kind of being the villain. It was a, yeah. It was kind of obvious. And that weird sergeant guy thing. One kind of being kind of redeemable. I, I was hoping that that sergeant was going to live. And then like he'd appear in a couple of episodes later, basically saving Turlo's life because he owed him one. But, mm. you know, he's, he, he saved Turlo's life. So I guess that's all he could ask for. Yeah, I guess. Um, but no, I, I I quite liked it, even though you know, nonetheless. Um, what do you think to Chameleon? You know, um, like uh, John Coleshaw as Chameleon and stuff. John Coleshaw as a Chameleon is great. I I really like how he portrayed it. I really thought he did a good job of mimicking the voice as best as he could, while also kind of giving it his new spin basically i think he said in the interviews he kind of changed the voice because a a tad bit because that was the voice of chameleon being controlled by the master Mm. and so he the chameleon probably has his own voice to some extent yeah i must admit i'm really looking forward to the the chameleon empire that looks quite interesting and there's some news on on, in vortex um they are going to be doing a uh, dalek empire time war Ooh. Apparently, but it's in it's in early planning. And I think I was talking to Humphrey about this before. Um, and this is a story that I want to see done, and I'm surprised they haven't done it yet. <clears throat> I want to see the origin story of the Autons. You wanted it to be sort of in the early <coughs> early adventures, didn't you? Well, maybe. I d I don't know. I mean it it could work as a third doctor story actually. Kind of like a third doctor and Joe story, you know. Mm. They, do you know what would actually be hmm. quite cool? Cool if they did for the third Doctor Adventures, actually a couple of stories where the brig, the brig is actually a companion in the TARDIS. For I think he's going to be um, Humphrey because obviously they're releasing the br- uh, brigs coming into the mm. third Doctor Adventures in the next volume, isn't he? Well, sure. So well, yeah, but they yeah. don't have the TARDIS is grounded then. But what I'm meaning is later on in well, they well they 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 very, well, they now very may well do. Yes, I think it'd be really interesting. Oh, bugger, we didn't cover um, Blake 7, did we? No. Actually, before we talk about Blake 7, we have not given our uh, ratings for Devil in the Mist. 7 out of 10? 7 out of 10, okay. I think I'd go 8.5. It's not a 9, but it's not an 8, personally, for me. I really enjoyed it. I like the hippo creatures. I'd love to see them face the... 
uh, what is it? The Chelonians? Yeah. Huh. That would be fun. Yeah. Gigantic hippo creatures and Giant cyborg man. turtles. That, I think that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Blake Seven. Yeah. Um, I've not listened to the audiobook, but, but, but I got a mention. My question got answered. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Just one second. You haven't listened to the audiobook? No, I haven't. But oh, again, <laughs> I'm strangely <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> But uh, but no, I did get a mention. My question got answered, which I was surprised at. Oh yeah. I asked about like, is there an in-universe in reason why uh, Stephen Greif was replaced by Brian Croucher? I can't remember his answer. Um, I think he said something like, "Well, it's you know just just acting, you know, availability and whatever." Um, but I was just very very surprised that he got answered. Yeah, that was quite, that was quite cool. Uh, Restoration Part One, which continues on from crossfire uh very very good really loving um blake seven that is really going from strength to strength yeah very interesting stories the characters are really being put through their paces uh loving the music uh, it's been confirmed there's going to be obviously two more box sets of restoration which will end series five and then there's going to be three more box sets of forecast audios for, C for series six and then they're going to stop and just do audiobooks, which makes sense. You know, obviously, Jack Clint's no longer with us. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul Darrow almost died. You know, Gareth Thomas is no longer with us. So, you know, I can kind of see why they've done it. And I, I'd rather them end on a high than, yeah. you, know, you know, them continue and yeah. they go, oh, oh shit, we can't do anymore because such and such is no longer with us kind of thing. So I'd give Restoration a good 9 out of 10. So um i guess that ends this episode of the doctor who lambert podcast episode 95 mm -hmm. we got a couple more till we get to 100 mm -hmm. and we'll see what we do then Indeed. perhaps oh. nothing yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with well, that being said, yeah, we uh, will be podcasting in the near future again. We're going to be looking at the uh, eras, their upsides and their downsides and um, whatnot. If, uh, join the conversation. We're on Twitter, Me, at least myself and Liam. I'm not sure about Humphrey. No, I don't have Twitter. Not yet. We have, uh, you could maybe tweet the Alhambra podcast and maybe we could relay the messages to to Humphrey through there. Yeah. Uh, tell us what you think. Email the show. Tweet the show. Discuss what you like about our era comparisons. Again, I, I will say, again, one of the most popular era co er, podcasts, besides the introductory podcast to Humphrey, is the Verdi Lambert versus Ennis Lloyd podcast. Oh, that's mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't interesting. I enjoyed the. I, I personally enjoy, enjoyed the Eric Sayward versus Andrew uh, Cartmel. Mm -hmm. I perhaps we could do another uh, one of those. In fact, yeah. I, I was thinking. Here's here's my thoughts. We could do a uh, David Whitaker mm -hmm. versus shoot his name just. But Robert Holmes. Mm. Oh, yes, because that's Hartnell and Tom Baker. Uh, it's Hartnell. Well, not only that, but... It's Hartnell and Troughton, remember? Because David Whitaker... Hartnell Hart and Troughton dogs. and David Whitaker had one story written for the third Doctor, which basically was put on hold for uh, forever, which is the Ambassadors of Death. Mm. Okay. Good story. Yeah, I think we should do that. So, uh, so yeah. So, tune in. Well, it, here's, here's an idea. David Whitaker, we could discuss David Whitaker as the writer because he did write w before he was script editor. We could also discuss David Whitaker as the script editor. Yep. We could also discuss Robert Holmes as the writer yeah. and then Robert Holmes as a script editor. I like that, actually. That's mm. quite cool. Yeah, I think we should do that. That's quite cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll All right. Find him. Well, well until next time. with that, Indeed. thank you for listening to the podcast, and we'll see you in time. You have been listening to the Doctor Who Alhambra podcast. Doctor Who is owned and trademarked by the BBC. Doctor Who Alhambra is not affiliated with the BBC or Big Finish. No infringement is intended. Visit our website at alhambrapodcast.weebly.com or email the show 
at alambraaudio at gmail.com. Tweet us at Alhambra Podcast. That is A-L-H-A-M-B-R-A Podcast. Thank you.